Good morning, friends, and welcome. Morning. Welcome to Washington National Cathedral. I am Dana Corsello. I'm the canon vicar of the cathedral. And on behalf of Mary and Buddy, our bishop, and Randy Hollerwith, our dean, and our guest celebrant this morning, Bishop Jean Robinson, I want to welcome you this morning to worship. I do have two announcements. Our back to school drive is underway. Today, these ministry leaders, they're terrific. They'll be back there at coffee hour. Everyone's welcome to join us for coffee hour. They will be collecting our backpacks and school supplies 
for students in wards seven and eight. They will be here next Sunday collecting backpacks and supplies as well. And if you join us for coffee hour and meet them, there's also another schedule where you can drop off book, excuse me, these backpacks during the week. So please make sure you stop by. And then secondly, right after this service, following this service, you can grab a cup of coffee. Paula Mays, one of our gifted ministry leaders, she will be leading a book talk on John Meacham's And There Was Light. This is that book that he wrote about Abraham Lincoln. So that class will take place in the cathedral boardroom library. What you would do is you'd walk outside, walk all the way around. It's sort of kind of catty corner. It's, there's a separate building on the back side of the cathedral. So that will take place right after this service. And I know Paula and all those who will be there would certainly welcome your presence. Now I want to ask who is here today for the first time visiting the cathedral? For the, raise your hands. Wonderful. So happy to see you. We love it. And I also want to offer a special welcome to those of you who were worshiping online. Without you, our community would not be complete. So now I ask everyone to get settled. I know many of you have probably hustled and raced to get here. So now let's get settled to be here so that we can be open uh, with the Holy Spirit's anointing. Thank you again and welcome.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praying together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who on the holy mount revealed to chosen witnesses your well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured in raiment white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty, who with you, O Father, and you, O Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> A lesson from the book of Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. 
But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. A lesson from the second letter of St. Peter. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to free refresh your memory, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. 
First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will. But men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The word of the Lord. Santo Evangelio de nuestro Señor Jesucristo, según Lucas. Jesús subió a un cerro a orar, acompañado de Pedro, Santiago y Juan. Mientras oraba, el aspecto de su cara cambió, y su ropa se volvió muy blanca y brillante. Y aparecieron dos hombres conversando con él. Eran Moisés y Elías, que estaban rodeadas de un resplandor glorioso y hablaban de la partida de Jesús de este mundo, que iba a tener lugar en Jerusalén. Aunque Pedro y sus compañeros tenían mucho sueño, permanecieron despiertos y vieron la gloria de Jesús y a los dos hombres que estaban con él. Cuando aquellos hombres se separaban ya de Jesús, Pedro le dijo, Maestro, qué bien que estemos aquí. Vamos a hacer tres chozas, una para ti, otra para Moisés y otra para Elías. Pero Pedro no sabía lo que decía. Mientras hablaba, una nube se posó sobre ellos, y al verse dentro de la nube, tuvieron miedo. Entonces de la nube salió una voz que dijo, Este es mi hijo, mi elegido. Escúchenlo. Cuando se escuchó esa voz, Jesús quedó solo. Pero ellos mantuvieron esto en secreto 
y en aquel tiempo a nadie dijeron nada de lo que habían visto. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking with him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came down and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, friends. Today we'll be celebrating the Feast of the Transfiguration of Christ. And today we'll be talking about glory. Glory. The glory of God. To God be the glory. Glory to you. Glory to me. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Glory to God in the highest. Do you believe in the glory of God? I do. I believe in God's glory and the glory of God's revelation. I like to think that I see glory everywhere, in nature, in mountains, in oceans, animals, in trees, and in the souls of human beings, in you. But then I'm charged with preaching about the transfiguration, and I find myself fumbling for words when challenged to define glory. Glory, is it a substance, a medium, some kind of glowing plasma through which God reveals and we humans perceive? Or is it a form of spiritual currency, something invisible but vital that we offer up to God, just as we offer up our singing voices and the material wealth we put in the collection plate? For me, glory is one of those abstract religious words 
we intuitively understand but have difficulty defining, even though we sing about it in our liturgy and profess it in our creed each week. Before I take a stab at that, let me review some history with you. The Transfiguration was recognized in most parts of the Byzantine Empire by the 9th century, but its observance was not fixed in the Western Church until Pope Callistus III marked this day in 1457 as a thank offering for the Crusaders' victory over the Islamic Turks at Belgrade. This is why we're celebrating this feast day today. Normally it falls during the week, but this year it fell on a Sunday. What is interesting, and even more unfortunate, August 6th also marks the infamous day in 1945 when the United States dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. I would argue that Jesus would have nothing to do with either of these events as they exemplify humanity's grotesque sin of death and destruction. The Transfiguration, when Jesus is revealed as God's revealer, radiant with divine love and incandescent mystery that the disciples witness with their own eyes, cannot commemorate a so-called victorious holy war. That's bad theology. Those of us Christians, though, who abide by the common lectionary must acknowledge the historical context of the 15th century, and in doing so, reject the glorification of war. The only thing our scripture tells us to glorify is God. Folks, I want you to settle in this morning because to understand the theology of Jesus' transfiguration, we've got to do some serious Bible study. So let's begin. Let's begin with our Exodus scripture. When Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the replacement tablets of the Ten Commandments. Remember, Moses went apoplectic and destroyed the first version after he discovered that the Israelites had gone behind his back and fashioned for themselves an idol of a golden calf when he was up on the mountain receiving the stone tablets. And to understand why Moses' face glows after he comes down from his second meeting with God, which lasted no less than 40 days and 40 nights, one must know that Moses, with flagrant chutzpah, makes one of the most brazen and startling requests in the Bible. He asks to see God's glory as proof that the Lord still considers the Hebrew people his chosen ones, and that the Lord will keep his covenant to guide them all the way home to the land of milk and honey. Moses says to God, show me your glory, I pray. It is in this monumental moment, God proclaims God's own name, Yahweh, the eternal, omnipotent, the one and only deity of Israel, and says, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. Yet, after Moses receives the second set of tablets, the Lord descends in a cloud and passes before Moses with this self-profession. The Lord, the Lord, a God, of, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and yet by no means clearing the guilty." End quote. You see, my friends, God's glory is a physical manifestation of the divine that not only inspires awe, 
but illuminates the character of Yahweh, the one the Israelites are to worship and praise with their entire being. The Hebrew word for glory, kabod, can be translated first as weight and second as magnificence. The Greek word doxa has the simple meaning of heaviness and was used to express the worth of a person in terms of majesty, brightness, or honor. So think of God's glory as awesome, indescribable, as eternal splendor, majestic, luminous love lit up like a celestial fire. Theologian John Piper surmised that Yahweh's glory is the perfect harmony of all of God's attributes into one infinitely beautiful and personal being. This brings me to the glory reflected on Moses' face. For one thing, he doesn't realize that he's beaming. For another, the veil he wears is not for himself, but to protect the people for being overcome by it. Do you remember that episode from the sitcom Friends when Ross overbleaches his teeth and they glow like he's holding a black light up to his mouth. Anybody remember that? Well, it's kind of like that. But here's the thing. Moses doesn't shine as a result of his own charisma. It is a reflected glory, like a full moon lit up by the sun that has been hidden by the turning of the earth and nightfall. It is a glow that comes from being in the presence of the Holy One. As C.S. Lewis described in his sermon entitled, The Weight of Glory, Moses' face shone because he had found favor with God. The simplistic definition of glory is to be known, appreciated, and delighted in by God. Lewis wrote, the promise of glory is the promise, almost incredible and only possible by the work of Christ, that some of us, that any of us who really chooses, shall actually survive that examination, shall find approval, shall please God. To please God, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness for glory means good rapport with God, acceptance by God, response, acknowledgement, and welcome into the heart of things. The door on which we have been knocking all our lives will open at last." End quote. Is this the same celestial approval that consumed Jesus on another mountaintop? Of course. Jesus' glory renders Peter, James, and John terrified, blinking, confused as he pulsates like a fusion reactor of delight, divine light and power. And if that weren't enough, the same theophonic cloud that spoke to Moses engulfs them too, a cloud that is more than weather. It is alive. It smells like lightning. This is Yahweh announcing his delight in his beloved son, imbuing him with glory. This is my son, my chosen one, the Lord exalts. Listen to him. It has taken me many years of studying the transfiguration texts in the Gospels to be able to understand and articulate a basic but important premise. The glorification the disciples witness with their own eyes confirms Jesus' identity as the Son of God, the Messiah. But even more, it shows them there will be life beyond the cross, and they will live it. There will be chaos, and there will be blood. Jesus will be arrested, tortured, crucified, and resurrected. But when the disciples witness Jesus transfigured, 
with Moses and Elijah by his side, they see through. They see God's hand and purpose in Jesus' life and beyond. What I'm trying to say is that they shouldn't have been so surprised and frightened when Jesus was resurrected from the dead and then ascended to be with God. Not to mention the Holy Spirit's wild rush on them at Pentecost. But they are mere mortals, right? The point is, when all is said and done, the mountain, this mountaintop, was the way for God to prepare this human band of companions for the sacred journey, to offer something to hold on to when they descend into the crushing reality of the world below. Now, this brings me to my final point, and this relates directly to you, and of course to me. Jesus said, no one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. My friends, how is God's glory reflected in your face, in your demeanor, in your body language? I know you have found favor in his sight. One of my favorite biblical words is countenance. I love the purposefulness of this word. It projects so much more than facial expression, doesn't it? Countenance is facial expression dressed up in its Sunday finest. To wit, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God's aura, God's countenance can literally bless us and so can yours. So I ask you, have you ever taken stock of your own countenance? I think it would behoove everyone if we, if we performed a regular countenance check, both individually and corporately. So, is yours glum, indifferent, arrogant, sad, smug, off-putting, negative, and sorry? My mother used to say, write that sorry face, you know, off your, that look off your face. She meant pouty. Or is your countenance welcoming, open, joyful, expectant, non-judgmental, gentle, and loving? Does it depend on the day? C.S. Lewis, in that same sermon, preached about possessing this glory. We are to shine as the sun. We are to be given the morning star. We want something else which can hardly be put into words, to be united with the beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it. This is the weight of God's glory. Glory as beauty, splendor, delight. It can emanate from our hearts too, and then be reflected from our countenance. And please know, I know that you hurt, and not every moment is a happy one. I'm not suggesting that we live with plastic faces for mere show. No, just as for Moses, the gift of glory begins in the close proximity to God to be in the presence of Christ Jesus through prayer, praise, and worship is the first step to a countenance adjustment. Just what you're doing today. It's really that simple. At any time, at any place, you can transfigure your countenance to reflect the glory of God. What a gift that is. So let's begin today. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. For Michael, the presiding bishop, Mary Ann, our bishop, and for all the clergy and people, including those ordained to the sacred order of priests this week at the cathedral, let us pray to the Lord. For Joseph, our president, and for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, for an end to war and conflict, especially in Ukraine. In the cathedral's weekly observance of prayers for the states and territories, we pray for the people and government of Connecticut. Let us pray to the Lord. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. For the aged and infirm, for the widow and orphans, for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, for all whose lives have been forever changed by gun violence, we pray for an end to such violence in our nation, that our schools, houses of worship, and communities may become places of safety for all. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. That we may end our lives in faith and hope without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. In the communion of Peter and Paul, our patrons, and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves to one another and all our life to Christ our God.
Loving God, open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you, that the whole world may be one with you as you are one with us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. Light in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. Nice sermon, and I want to pick right up on it. Yeah. So it's, it struck me uh, during your uh, comments about countenance that buildings and communities uh, have countenances as well. And uh, when I brought my uh, uh, father here, just before he died, uh, uh, he walked in and he said, as we came through those back doors, he had never traveled to Europe, he'd never been in a big cathedral, he said, it makes you feel so small. And that's part of, of what the builders of this and every great cathedral wanted to happen, was to, to uh, put us uh, in our right sizes compared to God's greatness. But there's another side to the cathedral, which is its countenance that we show to the world, or at least that we aspire to here. And that countenance is genuinely about welcome. And so I, I want to welcome each and every one of you. Um, actually, especially if you're not Episcopalians, this is an Episcopal church um, cathedral. Uh, but of course, being here in Washington, we get lots of of uh, guests from all over, not just other Christian denominations, but um, if you're here visiting us uh, from another uh, faith tradition or a person that claims no particular faith community, you are our special guest today and we want you to feel uh, incredibly welcome here. It's the countenance that we, we feel in our hearts, we hope uh, we express in our um, and our outward uh, show and uh, countenance. Um, as a way of, of making sure you understand that you are welcome here and welcome to join us in communion. I mean, after all, this, is, this table doesn't belong to the Episcopal Church or to this cathedral. It's God's table and no one is excluded from God's table. So to assist you a bit, let me just give you a few instructions because we Episcopalians are a little bit strange. Uh, if you'd like to come forward and receive the bread and wine of communion, the way we do that is you just put uh, one palm um, in the other and extend it and the, um, uh, the person will uh, put bread in your hand and you may consume it. And then move to the sides to take the wine. We ask you not to dip the bread into the wine but to actually uh, sip from the cup and it's fine to hold the bottom of the cup to guide it to your lips. Um, it's also complete communion if you just have the bread alone. If for some reason you would like to come forward and, and feel included in this but would rather not take communion, you may cross your arms across your chest and receive a blessing uh, in the name of the Holy One. So please know how welcome you are uh, this morning 
and I hope you feel at home here. Uh, this is indeed uh, a place of prayer for all of God's people. Um, however, um, this being the National Cathedral, you might think that we get lots of money from the government to keep this place up and running. And true to our Constitution's promise of separation of church and state, that does not happen. And so we depend upon you and your generosity uh, to keep these doors open for, for all people to come and find a place of prayer. So we invite you to give generously. Uh, you can also, in your program, find a QR code there that can um, uh, tell you about how you can contribute to the ongoing uh, life and ministry of this place. So please welcome, come forward, uh, be a part of us um, because we feel a part of you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you, and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit in the fullness of time. Put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with our patrons, the apostles, Peter and Paul, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God, third people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
praying together, loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, and renewed. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of, of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. 